Well, hey, ACF, I'm super excited to be with you tonight as we're going back into Colossians chapter 2 for our house church message. So here's what I'm going to do because I got my mic above me. I'm just going to try and be conscious of my notes because tonight is juicy. And I doubt we'll be able to get the whole chapter in one teaching, so we may just divide it into two. So let's jump right into it. And let's start at the beginning of chapter two. We'll read down to verse nine and start our text in verse nine and 10. This is what it says. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches and of the fullness of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Now, I'll pause there. Pastor Mark taught this last week and he did such an incredible job with it. Something that came up in our house church as we were discussing was the idea of philosophy. And is philosophy wrong? It would seem here that Paul is kind of digging on philosophy and he is. But what you need to understand is philosophy simply means the love of wisdom. And is there anything wrong with loving wisdom? Well, no, there's not. In fact, there's a whole book in the Bible called Proverbs on why you should love wisdom. Wisdom is a great thing. Wisdom is God-given, actually. And we know from verse 2 and 3 in chapter 2 that in Jesus Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's found in God. So the sum of all wisdom is actually found in the person of Jesus Christ and God our Lord. So here's the problem with this philosophy and why Paul is knocking on it. This early Gnostic mixed pseudo mix of Judah, Judah, blah, Jewish mysticism and asceticism, did I say that right? asceticism, um, has the idea of denying Jesus, of separating itself from Jesus, of denying his godhood or his manhood, or how could Jesus be fully God and still be in the flesh if all the flesh is evil? That's Gnosticism. Anything material is evil. So then God couldn't have even really made the world. Angels would have had to have made it for him. And just weird things like that that they were getting into. And Paul just straight up tells him like, look, this philosophy is actually wrong. It's actually demonic and it's evil. And so the idea here is if there is a philosophy that does not treasure Jesus, that does not hold Jesus at the center, it's not truly wisdom. Because in Jesus is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. At the source of all real truth, you find the person of Jesus Christ. That's the reality. And guys, this is such a good warning for you and I because our world is full of different philosophies. And I would say as you're learning, especially because some of you guys are in college that listen to this, as you're learning, as you're growing, as you're taking classes, always come back to the truth of the Bible. What does the Bible say on these things? Because that's true philosophy, God's teachings and God's doctrines on it. And I want to look again at this warning Paul leads them because it's kind of central to this passage in some ways. He's going to keep coming back to this idea over and over. But he says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. So their philosophy was empty, deceitful. It was not the truth. According to the traditions of men and according to the basic principles of the world. So this philosophy was not only empty and deceitful, but it was actually just the doctrines of man. And Paul's making a very clear point here. Man's doctrine, man's philosophies cannot stand 
with the word of God. The word of God is the sum of all truth. And if man's doctrine, man's philosophy opposes that, well then it's not true because Jesus is the source of all truth. So it's not according to Christ. For in him, for in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So in Jesus Christ, you and I experience fullness, completeness, because he is the fullness of God. That's, that's dealing with his deity, with his essence. He is truly God, 100% in all that he is. Is not less than, he is equal to God Almighty. And this was very particular to the struggle they were going through with this Gnostic, mystic, ascetic view. Well, let's jump down to verse 11 and start our text for today. Okay. Here's what I'd like to encourage you guys with. If you have a Bible with you, open it up. Today's study is probably going to be a little more in depth um, because there's so much packed into these verses and I don't want you to miss out. So grab your Bible, take a second, open it up to Colossians chapter two. If you haven't already, read along with me. This is what it says. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross." Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now you might be like, pause. We were just talking about philosophy, and now we're talking about circumcision, and then we start talking about baptism, and then we talk about the crucifixion. Paul, what are you talking about here? So this is where this is where Paul is addressing this multi-headed kind of monster, this heresy that had come in. People who look at this truly believe that there's a blend of three things going on. You have Jewish laws and some Jewish mysticism together mixed in here. You have early Gnosticism that hasn't fully formed yet, but it's probably forming at this time. And you have this asceticism, this denial, neglect of the body, which comes in later in this chapter that's also kind of paired with it. So it's very much this higher philosophy, higher truth mentality, which is incredibly dangerous. In fact, I would encourage you to always be careful when someone's telling you that they have this new revelation, this higher truth, this higher knowledge. In fact, most cults would probably claim that. Greater spiritual awareness, greater amplification and experience uh, spiritually. I remember talking with some Mormon guys and I've had conversations with Mormon elders and missionaries and even a seminary student. But I was talking with these missionaries and you know, they're trying to convince me that we have the same Bible, the same Jesus. And so I stop them, I say, if it's truly Jesus, then Jesus is enough. And when I didn't wanna talk later, he said, well, when you're ready for more truth, you'll know where to find us. See guys, there is no more truth other than Jesus. And that's what's happening here. They're teaching more truth over Jesus. Like, oh, you have Jesus, but that's not enough. You need more. And our world is full of people today who still do that. That the blood of Jesus isn't enough. The sacrifice of Jesus, the grace of Jesus. You also need these other things on top of it. You need to, de- you need to deny your body, neglect your body, abuse your body. You need to get circumcised and keep laws and you need to be legalistic. You need to have this higher awareness of spirituality and, and, and blah. So literally what's going on? I mean, they just went overboard, worshiping angels and all sorts of stuff. So this is where Paul's starting to address this, but he's gonna come at that legalistic view right now. And I find it interesting that even though he's addressing this philosophy, that it's truly just legalism, which I thought was interesting because legalism is more... 
Legalism is more than just tradition. I think of legalism, I think of people who are staunch about all these rules and regulations and things like that, but it's also the idea of ritual and formula. And so even in their philosophy, their ritual and formula, there's legalism. And guys, the reason I think that's important because legalism is actually at its core, anything that you and I do to attempt to make ourselves right with God apart from his works or his salvation that he's made available through Jesus Christ. It's you and I trying to relate or connect to God or earn God through our own endeavors and our own works. And that goes to anything, even even like the new age philosophy is legalism, right? It's my efforts, my works to free myself and have greater spiritual consciousness. Even Buddhism and Hinduism, in the end, it's legalism. It's me trying to afflict myself or meditate enough that I can achieve this greater understanding, greater enlightenment. Hinduism, I have 33 million gods that I need to please somehow and, and, uh, and pacify. Even all the way down in South America, when I, I watch people get into spiritism, it's very much legalism. I have to do these things and these rituals in order to appease these beings. And so at the end of it, I actually found this incredibly interesting that apart from Jesus Christ, it's all legalism. Anything that I endeavor to do to earn favor from God, that's legalism. Me working to get something from him. And so Paul comes against this here. He says, in him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So obviously what's going on is that it got this mosaic piece to it. That's the Jewish element coming in their doctrine where they're pushing upon them the need to be circumcised as a sign of what's going on in their life, the transformation or uh, maybe growing in that spiritual awareness. You have to do these extra works or whatnot. And Paul's just letting them know that that's not the case. These are Gentile believers. It was not a common practice like it is now um, for people to be circumcised in the world. That was only the Hebrews at that day and age. And nowadays in Western medicine, it's very popular for people to be circumcised for medicinal reasons, but that wasn't the case then. And so wherever Paul went, oftentimes legalistic Jewish people, or these, this case, these Gnostics, would come behind him and tell people, well, just having Jesus is enough. Now you need to observe the law of Moses or you have to do these other things. And so they would usually impress upon them, you need to be circumcised because that was the sign of the covenant. That's why they did it. The Jews were circumcised as a sign of their covenant with God. And so that's what's being imposed on them. But Paul would argue and say that they've actually already been circumcised. They've had a spiritual circumcision and it's a putting off of the flesh, but not like physical circumcision. It's a putting off of the flesh and the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Paul would dive into this more in Romans and tell them, you're not a Jew who's one outwardly, but inwardly. The circumcision that matters is not the outward one, but the inward one of the heart. It's the work Jesus Christ does when he becomes the Lord and savior of our lives. I'm spiritually circumcised. My body of sins and this flesh being put off by the circumcision of Christ. Because now inside of me, what was once dead is now alive. My spirit, the way that I would relate to God and have relationship with God. Well, that was dead while I was in sin. But when I came to Christ, he made me alive. And my old man, that sinful nature was crucified with Christ. And now I get to walk in the new man, the man after the spirit of God. And that's the work of the spirit in my life. And for you and me, there's, there's gonna be that wrestling match, right? And we're gonna get into that later in Colossians 3. The old man, the old ways, the old habits and sins, they try to creep back up and you not have to put them down. We have to say no through the power of the spirit and walk in the spirit. But Paul argues with them, you've already been circumcised. You've just been circumcised spiritually and that's where it really matters. But he's going to develop this thought more. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God. Now, this was actually really interesting to me. Because Paul brings baptism in here, right next to circumcision. And you're like, 
Why would you do that, Paul? What are you even talking about? Well, it would seem here that what Paul is saying to them as, if you're looking for this ceremonial stamp or this sign of the inward transformation Christ has done in you, these Gnostics would say you have to be circumcised. Paul says, actually, you just need to look to your baptism. Because as a Christian, that is the kind of ceremony that you and I go through when we get saved. We get baptized and it's a picture of our association and public declaration of our association with Christ. And this is what Paul would say about that. You are baptized in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Because when you and I are baptized, it is a picture of us going into the water, buried with Christ. And then just as Christ was raised, so you and I get raised up out of the water as well. And it's a public declaration of who Jesus is to me as my Lord and Savior, of who I am to him as his child, and of the work that he has done in my life. So Paul encourages these believers, if you feel like you need to look to something to to say, it's testifying of my inward transformation, he says, you just need to look at baptism, not at circumcision. And I would encourage you guys, If you are saved, but you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. It's actually a step of obedience to God. Now, are you not saved if you're not baptized? No, that's not what this is saying. But it is that first little step of obedience of me publicly declaring that Jesus, I believe in you. You are my Lord and Savior. And I'm acknowledging that in front of others. And it's a powerful step. This past Easter, we baptized people right off the stage and it was amazing. So many people came forward making that public declaration. And I'd encourage you, if you also want to make that public declaration, you can reach out to the church. Um, You can reach out to one of our pastors. We would love to baptize you if you don't go to our church and you just watch online. I would encourage you, contact one of your local pastors and see if they'll baptize you and invite your friends and family to witness it. It is a special ceremony in the life of a Christian as I publicly acknowledge who Jesus is to me. Well, let's keep going. He said, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So this was you and me apart from Christ. We were dead in our trespasses. And a trespass has the idea of crossing the boundaries, of of sinning in a way that's more than just I did wrong, but I intentionally crossed the line. I've transgressed. I've trespassed. That's what that's saying. So that's you and me. We were dead in our sins. We've crossed the line as rebels against God, born in sinful nature, right? In the uncircumcision of your flesh, you were dead spiritually. But look what it says. He has made a life together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So these believers who are struggling because these heretics are telling them they have to continue doing more things to find forgiveness or acceptance or spiritual awareness, Paul says, stop. He goes, look, you've been forgiven. You were once dead. You were dead, lost in your trespasses, but you've been forgiven and you've been made alive. And not only has God forgiven, but he's forgiven us all of our trespasses, all the ways that we've crossed the line, he has forgiven. And he would develop this more saying, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. The handwriting that was written, or the handwriting requirements that was against you and I the ways that you and I have transgressed against God, trespassed, the ways that you and I have broken his holy standards, the way we've failed to live up to it, the debt that you and I owe him as as humans who have sinned and polluted his perfect world. That list of requirements is wiped away, taken away, because God nailed it to the cross. Guys, what a powerful truth. If you are in Jesus Christ, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are forgiven. You're forgiven. And I've told you guys before, and I'll I'll keep saying it, but I imagine the cross of Calvary 
Jesus's lifeless body hanging on it. And I imagine all these scrolls nailed to the cross with all the crimes of different people listed on them. And somewhere on that cross is your scroll and my scroll. My, my list of decrees are my list of requirements that I failed, that I owe God, that I can't live up to, and the blood of Jesus Christ just dripping over them. God has taken the ways that I have trespassed. He has nailed it to the cross with Jesus so that I could be forgiven. Guys, what good news is this? Don't let anyone cheat you, deceive you. We'll talk more about that next week into something that's empty, that's gonna cost you your reward. Because if you're in Christ, you're set free. There's no need for observances and legalism and works that I have to do and things that I have to become or do in order to achieve something from God or receive something from God. That's just not true. It's actually heresy. It's the philosophy of man and of the world. God has made a way through his son, Jesus. And if you have received Jesus, Jesus is enough. The gospel is simplistic, praise the Lord. And in its simplicity, it's also offensive because you and I feel like it's too easy. But praise God that the Lord made it simple because the gospel is so simple, it is for everyone. It's not just for the spiritual guru or the monk or the one who goes out in the desert and meditates for 20 years. That would be hard for, for all of us. But the gospel instead is that Jesus Christ has come down and lived the perfect life that you and I could not live, fulfilling the righteous requirements and standards of God's law and offering himself as a living sacrifice or as a sacrifice on yours and mine's behalf on the cross, being put to death, which is the penalty of sin, that you and I could receive the acceptance and forgiveness of God at no cost to us. That's why it goes against legalism. Legalism says you and I have to do something to achieve it. God says, no, I've already done everything that needs to be done. There's no more works that need to be done to be saved, just to believe. Because it did cost someone something. It cost Jesus everything. And for you and I, we're just to receive it now by faith. Well, praise the Lord. I'm so grateful. And we just celebrated Easter that three days after Jesus died, he rose again that you and I could receive life and relationship with God that is eternal. So that's 20 minutes. We'll pick it up again next week. I would encourage you guys in your small groups, talk about legalism. Talk about the deceitfulness of it. Because here, here's why I say that. Because it's so easy for you and I to fall into legalism. It's so easy for you and I to slip into the mindset of I need to do something to please God or to receive something from God, but that's not really what the scripture teaches. So God bless you guys. We'll catch you again next week on the House Church Message.